division in the Biocomplexity Institute at the University of Virginia. And I am delighted to introduce Claire McKay Bowen, who doesn't really need any introductions, um, but to the seminar. I had the privilege of reading some of the early versions of her book, Protecting Your Privacy in a Data-Driven World, and was quite excited about it. And initially, um, she was saying it was targeted to an audience that knew nothing about privacy or statistics. And I was like, wait, no, I pretty much think anyone in a statistical agency needs to read this book just to have a firm foundation of the history of privacy in the United States and how it's come up to the current day. Um, so the book is accessible to those to non technical people, but I think it's equally important to those uh, with a technical background as well. Uh, the, so she talks about the history, as I mentioned, going back um, to early times. Uh, we're a nation of just a little over 300 years old. Um, but she also extends the explanations as well to the European Union's general data protection um, regulations. And then even how current US states have adopted the GPTR and actually improved upon it as well. So Claire has an undergraduate degrees in mathematics and physics from Idaho State University and a master's and PhD in statistics from the University of Notre Dame. And she likes to quote John Tukey about why she became a statistician, and it's because she can play in everyone's sandbox, and she always adds, on their very applied problems. So she's definitely somebody after my own heart as well. Um, today, Claire is going to talk about her work as the lead data scientist for privacy and data security at the Urban Institute. And her research focuses on developing and assessing the quality of differentially private data synthesis methods and science communication. So she has a very engaging and lively presentation planned. So we want to encourage you to provide questions in the chat. Um, Claire will address as she can clarifying questions throughout the talk. Um, and then definitely we will do our best to answer the questions uh, at the Q&A at the end of the talk. So Claire, I turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that great introduction. I am very excited to be talking about my book, again, Protecting Your Privacy in a Data-Driven World. I'm not going to, quote unquote, like go through every single part of the book, just kind of give you a nice uh, general overview. So one of the things I'm going to definitely highlight is why should you care about privacy? What do I mean by data privacy and why it's so important? Give some background as to how we address this issue. So I actually don't go over one of the bigger chapters in the book, which is actually the history about how we came to uh, accept some of these methods into uh, like census or Bureau of Labor Statistics or in general any of the federal agencies. So I encourage you to read my book to get to that part of the chapter. Um, but I will go into some of that background on like a high level of like what is done in the federal statistical agencies and what are some of the current methodologies of how we try to address those issues that on trying to ex safely expand access to data. And then kind of digging a little bit into what are some of the current challenges and why it's so hard to protect this data. And I do highlight a little bit of those privacy laws, but again, don't go into too deep because again, it's this is only a 45 minute talk and there's only so much I can go over it. And then of course, give me some thoughts for the future. So with that, I wanna get it started. So the motivation, like why should we care? So it's interesting in my book, I talk about Cambridge Analytica scandal because it happened exactly two days before I defended my dissertation. And at the end of my dis uh, dissertation defense, excuse me, uh, people immediately asked me, what did I think about the Cambridge Analytica scandal and how is it going to affect my future work in data privacy? And uh, anybody who knows me, I'm sometimes a little too blunt, but at least I do it with a smile. So I, I said, well, it doesn't change anything. It's just going to make it easier to pitch why this is important and make it easier for funding. <laughs> and so in that bluntness, I, I realized that a lot of people didn't know that this these problems that we have on trying to make sure that we protect the people who contribute to the data while still also making it useful, those, those issues has lasted or have been around for decades. And so one of the examples I talk about in the book, and I think it's really highlighting about this, that tension that we hear about that, the trade-off between making sure the data is high quality, but at the same time protecting individuals is this one that came actually from the New York Times article back in December of 2019. So for those who are not familiar with this article, it talks about how the, the reporters take a data set that only has the location, so longitude, latitude, coordinates, and time of of individuals and they were able to figure out that one individual 
obviously lived in Redmond, Washington, because they were in that kind of like residential neighborhood of Redmond during sleeping hours. And that during working hours, they were on the Microsoft campus. So they're like, they, this person obviously works at Microsoft. And so they kind of followed this person over a few months and on the data and then realized that at one point, this person deviated from the routine and went to the Amazon campus one afternoon, then went back to Microsoft after a couple months and then started regularly going to Amazon. So with that information alone, they were able to track him down on LinkedIn and find out the person is Ben Bernoulli, who is going to be in charge of the Amazon Prime Air initiative with the drones. And so some people think, okay, well, that was way too much information. Obviously, they figured out like the gender and things like that. And it's like, no, it was the bare bone information of just location and time. So what we see here is that there's so enough auxiliary information around us that we can link it to those individuals that we think we're protecting. Again, it's it was LinkedIn and figuring out that person has to be living or working at certain places because they were there at certain times. So then an argument could be said that, well, that data obviously is too much then. We should not release this at all. This is way too sensitive. People could get stock. We could figure out if somebody has kids, so on and so forth. However, this is the kind of data that FEMA uses to figure out how to do a more, be more efficient on emergency evacuations for natural disasters like the wildfires that we've been having raging in the United States and hurricane. It's also the data that we need to do contact tracing. And so these are some screenshots from articles back from the summer of 2020, where there was a big call about the fact that we do not have enough public data to figure out how we can combat COVID-19 prior to having vaccines. And of course, everybody said, why don't we do contact tracing? Well, to do contact tracing effectively, we need to know people's location and time. Another issue with the lack of data access is that it, this kind of highlight, the whole pandemic also highlighted an issue that I'll be talking throughout this whole whole talk as well as uh, I speak about it in my book is the inequity of some of these privacy methods. So back in early 2020, when the pandemic started, everybody heard that messaging about like, you should wash your hands for 20 seconds, right? At least that way to make sure that we won't spread the disease. Well, the thing is, is that a lot of the reservations or what we call Pueblos here in New Mexico. So pausing for a moment, to those who don't know, I'm actually in New Mexico. So in New Mexico, we share part of the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation, which was hit one of the hardest, especially I think it was May of 2020, where they actually had per capita more cases of COVID than New York City, uh, more than 30% of the residents do not have running water. So that kind of messaging was completely missed for certain cultural groups, and it's because we don't have data. Now, some people think, okay, now we learned our lesson, obviously, right? Like COVID hit during 2020, we're fine for 2021 when we had vaccines. That is still not the case. We don't have enough racial data to like even make an effective rollout of vaccines. And that's, we did see that too in New Mexico. And what ended up happening was the governor had to do some initiatives to outreach to the tribes and figure out what was the best way because there actually isn't any data for that. So now that I gave you some hopefully great motivation as to why this is really important to figure out how can we get access to data to be at a certain accuracy level. But of course, there are all those privacy concerns. How does it to, traditionally we get access to that data now and what are we doing? So I like to tell people that when we're trying to access confidential data, we basically have like this these three layers. The first layer is like the data user who are researchers, data practitioners, or others who use the data for whatever kind of purposes. And so they obviously have certain like queries or questions or analyses that they want to do. And so as a privacy expert, I try to take those queries or these kind of analyses that the, the users want and work with the data maintainer or the curator or steward, the person who's in charge of the data, who collects it and is responsible for its safety. And so we try to work together, looking at the data, figuring out what are these analyses, and then highlight, okay, these are the statistics that the data user actually wants, but again, we can't release them fully because of certain privacy concerns. So we put them through what is called statistical disclosure control or uh, limitation. So this is actually the field within statistics that we try to balance the need for privacy and utility or accuracy of the data by applying data privacy and confidentiality methods. And so after we've kind of did some alterations to the statistics, we get some of the results out. And from the output of that, the data users will get access to either some sort of like interface. Sometimes it's a terminal where they have no direct access to the data, but they'll have like, uh, I'll ask a question and then they get a noisy answer back. 
or they'll get a public use file, which is the most common way people kind of envision getting access to data is they get some sort of public version of the data set where they can take the data and like download it into, or excuse me, um, download it and then put uh, visualize it either through like Python or R or SAS or whatever analysis like program they want to use. So that all seems great. So why is it so hard then? Those, those, those approaches I just said and broadly, that seemed to work out well. Okay, so in the first scenario, where, or one of the scenarios, I said that you get a public use file or public data. And so sometimes the user thinks like, let's say an example, they want access to low income. And so this is great because then they can kind of subset the data down to what they want and do their analysis. Now, the issue with this is that we're going back to the core problem of how do we measure utility or usefulness? That, that seems pretty hard, right? Some people will have one version of what they think is how to define accuracy of the data versus another. And that's the same with disclosure risk too. So let me back up to the, the utility aspect. Let's do another example where we think of like census, like the 2020 census, which was very much on our minds uh, the last couple of years. That data is used for a lot of things. And so maybe top of mind, you think, oh, obviously that's important for redistricting data, figuring out how we should allocate our $1.5 trillion federal budget. Uh, FEMA uses it, all those things. Those are really important. Maybe we should use those as examples of measuring the accuracy. Well, at the same time, you have we have no idea what else this data is used for, right? It's publicly available. There's a lot of things people use. And so one of the ones I thought was really interesting is there's a county in Ohio that uses the decennial census data to figure out how many restaurant permits they give out. So that gets into the question of like, at what point do you determine that it's enough for the accuracy? Because it's nearly impossible to figure out exactly everything that somebody's going to use the data for and then benchmark the accuracy on all those different metrics. Now, at the same time, you think of disclosure risk. Now, you're trying to predict how somebody might attack the data. Are they trying to find one person? Are they trying to find a group of people? Are they trying to infer something that you might not think might be dangerous, but can be dangerous later on, which I'll get to that in a little bit later in this talk. So it becomes this really tricky aspect of trying to figure out and predict how people are going to behave, which we already learned that predicting people's behavior is very hard. Now, the other framework that I was talking about is that whole interface, which people tend to really like because you don't have any access to the data. There's something in between you and that data set and you just can ask questions. So let's say the person asks, hey, what is the average income? And in the original data, it's 45,000, but this interface with some sort of mechanism says like, okay, the noisy answer is going to be 50,000. So that seems great, but then you get into issues of, well, how you determine that amount of noise is exactly right. Is it too much? Are you adding unnecessary amount of noise and purposely making it too inaccurate that's even like useless to the person? Or is it too little? And we have some privacy concerns because again, we're trying to figure out uh, making sure that it's not identifiable of that individual. And also, how do you limit the number of queries? Because even if you try to predict how somebody is going to interact with that system, people are smart <laughs> and they are always going to try to game the system. So let's just say that a follow-up question to this first one, which is, well, how much does Claire's income deviate from the average? And if the person who made the interface didn't predict that, well, in two questions, my privacy uh, will be violated. Oh, and I see a question for M. Is it middleware or layer? I think of M as like mechanism or like some sort of algorithm. So that's why I was putting M in. Sometimes I put an A, but in this case, I put an M for the slides. Uh, so that's a response to Mark Otto in the chat. All right. Again, if you guys have questions for clarification, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll try to answer them. So now this goes into uh, the next part, which is, well, how does a privacy expert try to balance these competing needs and kind of goes through a workflow? Now, I'm not gonna say that this is the perfect workflow, but this is one that I see that's often implemented with other privacy experts. So I'm just gonna give you this general, like a step-by-step -step as one would go through. So the first step is you need to figure out what is that threshold for privacy or the disclosure risk and utility. So what are the use cases? What is the data going to be ultimately used for is one of the ways to think of the use case. And then the disclosure risk, like are there certain laws in place? Do you need to make sure that there are no less, like less than three, that, that's usually the magical number people like is the, the less than three role, no, or no unique individuals and so on and so forth. After you determine those thresholds, you then need to figure out what parts of the data are not necessary. And usually that's the PIIs or the personally identifiable pieces of information here. So 
you don't want to have any like people's names or social security numbers or things like that. So you remove any data that's just way too sensitive at all. Even if you like alter it, you cannot release. The next step is to figure out after that, what are the necessary variables for anonymization? So you think, well, maybe that's just all the remaining ones uh, after you remove the PIIs, but sometimes it's not, sometimes it's a subset. Uh, for example, I work with the IRS and one of the data sets we work with is over 3000 variables and we subset it down to 200. <laughs> so this is, that's the necessary step of figuring out like what are the key variables that it's needed for people to use. Then we go into the next step, which is, well, you have to develop a process or the statistical disclosure control to, to alter the data based on kind of the disclosure risks. Now, I'll go into that in a little bit of some of the methods, but this is the part where you have to then balance against like, well, after you made some alterations, compare it to the data quality. What are your metrics for utility? This is really important because then you end up repeating steps four and five multiple times usually, especially if it's a very complex data set, because you're trying to balance that whole are the disclosure risks too high? Are we altering too much of the data? Then it makes the utility not as useful and, and, and won't, we might as well not release the data set at all. Or maybe we're just not hitting that privacy uh, need even though we're hitting all the other metrics for, for accuracy. And so after doing some iterations and sometimes it can be pretty fast because maybe the data set is simpler or it could take months or years to develop because again, the data is very complicated until you finally get a published data or statistic. And so that's our last step here. Do I have any other questions before we move on? Also, I know that I talk fast if I get really excited. So <laughs> if I'm talking too fast, please let me know. Okay, I will move on. So some of the methodology, and this is the part where some of you might be now thinking, okay, great, we talked about risks, we talked about utility. Okay, how do you actually measure that? And like, how do you apply some of these methods? So this is the part of the talk that I discuss in full, uh, better, I should say full, uh, more detail in the book. It's dedicated in, I believe, chapters three and four. So a lot more <laughs> details here, but again, giving you an overview. So when we determine risks, we can think about like intuitively, okay, is it, can we identify somebody? Can we find certain characteristics or can we infer from them? So I liked the, these three types of risks, but I, there's some papers that argue there's a fourth one. And sometimes people say it's just the first two, but in general, I like to think about them in these three areas of identity, attribute and inferential. So what do I mean by identity? It's where you're going to try to find that specific person in the data set. And the most common way this risk happens is what we call record linkage. It's finding that record in one data set and connecting them to another one that might have more information. This commonly happens when the data set that we have altered because it has too much personal information, doesn't have the name, but then another data set which appears safe does have the people's names and it gets linked into the confidential data set. So here's an example. Uh, from there's a professor, a computer science professor at Harvard. Her name is Latanya Sweeney, very famous uh, privacy expert. And she looked at voter data and uh, personal uh, genome project data sets. So this data set was actually curated by the Harvard, now I can't remember the department, but there was a department at Harvard that was trying to collect data, trying to figure out ways to do personalized medicine. So they were collecting a lot of very personal information, figuring out people's medication, diagnosis, and procedures. They were stripped all PIIs, but they kept the zip the date of birth and gender. And that was just enough to identify, I believe it was over like 22%, or it was like almost 30, like, yeah, between 20 and 30% of people uh, with voter data. And so I personally don't really care if people know that I'm affiliated to certain parties, but I do care if they know what kind of medications I'm taking. And so that is an example of an identity disclosure risk. Another, the next one is attribute. So it's just trying to see if there's certain kind of characteristics, like maybe for a group of people, or just like maybe one person, you, you get uh, some characteristics of them and they kind of infer further what kind of person they are and then eventually identify them. And so that sounds a little vague. So what do I mean by that? One example I give now is that we're in this kind of still lingering COVID pandemic. But if we all think back to early 2020, a lot of us couldn't leave our homes because we were not essential workers. But imagine if we were to have location and time data again, just like that, that one that New York Times had, you could easily figure out who were the essential workers, right? Whether or not they are, uh, let's say into the future time period, you could just like tag those people that they are essential workers. And then in the future, you're like, okay, well, they are still 
obviously working in those uh, areas, it, even after we did the lockdown, they probably have a higher risk of catching COVID or having long COVID or maybe some other characteristics. Well, we're just going to raise insurance premium for them. So that's even though they didn't identify specifically those people, the person who has access to that data could figure out like maybe they're a grocery store worker, maybe they're like I'm picking out my my poor spouse here. <laughs> my spouse got to keep working because he worked on uh, at Sandia National Labs, which is a Department of Energy place, and he works on confidential uh, projects. And so he would be an essential worker and would be tagged into that kind of data set. So that's not something we would want. Then finally, inferential disclosure risk. So the classic example people think about is if you can identify if somebody is smoking, you can then infer that they're more likely to have cancer and then you raise their premiums that way. Uh, a different example I like to give is the fact that there was a study, I think it was in 2016, that some Stanford researchers were able to take cell phone metadata and figure out when people were calling a cardiologist and this cardiologist specialized in some like rare disease. And so they were able to infer high probability this person had a uh, increased chance of passing away given this disease. And so that's another way to target those people and say your insurance premiums are gonna go up. So obviously, <laughs> I say obviously, I think a lot of us are aware of that, like those measures of privacy are, are not what we keep hearing about with the 2020 census, right? Because everybody's like, what about differential privacy? What about this privacy loss budget? Isn't that a definition of privacy? And it is, and I categorize it separately from statistical disclosure control other methods, other statistical disclosure control methods, because even though I can argue that differential privacy goes into that umbrella or that general field of studying data privacy and confidentiality, the way that differential privacy approaches the idea of privacy loss or risk is so different than what we have traditionally done. I classify them as traditional methods versus differential privacy. So when I say that, just keep that in mind. That's what I mean when I say traditional versus differential privacy. So why is it so different? Those other methods, those made sense, right? They were pretty intuitive. You think, okay, somebody is going to do a record legacy attack. Somebody is going to infer something from the data or make a model, things like that. What does differential privacy do? Well, it takes a clean slate and or yeah, basically it starts with a clean slate. I was going to say it takes everything that we normally know and just crumples it up and throws it out the window, really. It's not at all intuitive and it's pretty hard to uh, wrap around. But for this talk, I'm going to hit it on three high levels on what do I mean by differential privacy and what does it, it stand for? So so if anything else, if you take anything from differential privacy, these are the, th the three things I want you to take away. So first, differential privacy defines the maximum privacy loss that it can result from a data publication or statistic. The reason I'm saying this is that during when everybody was hearing the announcement of the 2020 census, I saw a lot of blogs or articles saying that differential privacy is a method. And it isn't. It's a privacy definition or it's a condition that a method needs to satisfy in order to be differentially private. There's not one differential privacy method. There are different kinds of methods. So I'm going to pause everyone right there and say it is a definition. And the way it protects privacy or kind of what we need to try to wrap our heads around is that in order to protect this data set here, Differential privacy tries to say that you need to consider all the whole universe of all possible data that could resemble this data set. So you have all this other data. You also have to think of all future data. So this is actually a huge difference between the traditional thoughts of, of privacy versus differential privacy, is that differential privacy says you have to consider basically the universe of possible data sets. So again, this is like new data, future data. What could possibly be done? What are ones that we can't think of at the moment, but that could be? And also the fact that it was like, well, a limited computer power. Think of somebody who's going to just like hammer away at that data set just to like brute force the answer out. And so that's one way to think about differential privacy is just the absolute worst case scenario. And that's how it's gonna be able to quantify and provide a knob for what is the privacy loss. So that's the, the second thing to take away from differential privacy is that it does give you this knob or we hear as epsilon or the privacy loss budget that adjusts the trade-off between privacy and accuracy. And so I'm going to kind of give this it kind of like a traffic light in this sense, but we have the original data, this public use data, and completely useless data. And so somewhere in between, that's where the public data set is. And so how Epsilon works is that if we increase Epsilon, so as it approaches infinity, it should resemble the original data. I say should, because if you did a really bad method, then you could get something like that totally misses the mark. But assuming you did a proper method, 
a differentially private method on this to generate this public use data. As epsilon increases towards infinity, you should get the original data set. Now, as epsilon approaches zero, you should get something completely useless because again, it's, this is a knob that allows you to adjust like how accurate of the data that you want. Now you're thinking, what is useless data and why doesn't epsilon become zero? So if we say epsilon equals zero, that means that there's no information at all. So you basically just shut the door. There's no access to the data, there's nothing. So that's epsilon equals quote, quote, zero. What you can think of as epsilon approaches zero could be really, really, really tiny. So you can think of like 0 0.000000, 000, 000, 000, however many zeros you want. One, you can have a data set that, let's say, if it's a healthcare one for New Mexico, we could just say it's every, every person is Claire. I mean, that's probably a bad example because that would mean that everybody has information about me. But as a data user, you probably think, well, this is totally useless because it has one person replicated 2.5 million times for the whole state of New Mexico. So that's one way you can think about the useless data. And then finally, the part to think about for differential privacy is that it, because we're able to quantify or get that kind of knob with Epsilon, you can compose or compute the total potential privacy loss from multiple individuals or releases of the data publication or statistics. And so what do I mean by that without going into like the deep math here? At a high level, we can think of like, well, we have this original data. And I want to make two data sets out of it, this public use data sets. One of them, I'm going to say epsilon equals one. And the other one, I'm going to say it's from epsilon equals two. And so since both of these public data sets came from the same original data set, we can say that, oh, in total, it is three. So we're able to quantify that. Versus, let's say I make two disjoint or like partition the data into two disjoint sets. And so now it becomes that if one data set used epsilon equals one, the other one used two, therefore the total is actually two. So that's actually one of the neat features of, of using differential privacy or other what we call formally private methods is so you can compose and compute this total budget. Now, some people are probably thinking, or perhaps you are more familiar with differential privacy. You're like, okay, is that true for like all statistics then? I can imagine like thinking about the maximum wealth or median wealth. So those are great questions. So let's like go into that right there. So. Again, I like using examples. And so let's think about the fact that we're going to add quote unquote noise to a data set and the data set is us. So I see that there's 80 participants. So let's just say we're 80 records in the data set and this is a social economic data. And we're going to try to figure out what is the median income of this data set. So if a method were to satisfy differential privacy, it should kind of work like this, where again, I already said that if we were to crank up the privacy loss budget, right? Increase it. That means we're going to increase the accuracy. So we shouldn't be getting an answer that is pretty close to the original, right? But also to think about the fact that medium is a pretty robust statistic. So even if we were to add or subtract somebody who's like a stream possible case, because again, differential privacy thinks about the worst case scenario. So who's the worst case scenario to be part of our data set that could be magically in the universe of possibilities? Well, let's say Jeff Bezos. So Jeff Bezos is part of our data set or he isn't part of our data set, then that means that, well, that statistic shouldn't change. That median wealth shouldn't change too much. Uh, so we call this the global sensitivity and that it's going to be pretty low. So a method that actually satisfies differential privacy is adding noise from a Laplace distribution. So this is the distribution I'm showing here on the screen. And so here we have like much higher probability of adding a value that is close to zero. So we're going to get their true answer in this case of like, what is the median wealth? Versus, let's say that we have a different kind of question that's very sensitive. So let's shift the question to what is the maximum wealth of this room? Well, if Jeff Bezos was part of, of this uh, seminar, and if let's say he decides to leave and we were to calculate both of those times, that answer would change quite a bit. So the global sensitivity for that question of what is the maximum wealth would change quite a bit. So that means the global sensitivity is much higher. Another way to think about it again is that remember our knob, our epsilon, if it's decreased, that means less accuracy. So again, this is going to widen our distribution here, this Laplace distribution. We're gonna add a lot more noise, have a higher probability of doing so.
So again, I'm going to emphasize that the fact that in these two areas, we have these traditional, very intuitive definitions of privacy, but then we also now have this kind of like parallel avenue of differential privacy, where it's a completely different way of thinking. And I don't, I'm not expecting everybody to understand even my three takeaways, but hopefully you have a better understanding of what I mean by differential privacy and why it's so different and why it's a little challenging to like make sure that there are methods that satisfy it. Cause you have to think again, what is the worst possible case scenario? Okay, we emphasize quite a bit on the privacy aspect. What about the usefulness? So I'm gonna quickly go through this part because I think a lot of us are familiar with these, like such as summary statistics. So a quick way to double check is to look at a variable and see is the mean variance or skewness or ketosis, excuse me, are, are about the same. How much bias are we introducing? So those are nice quick checks to look at. Another one is doing outcome specific analyses. So it's to run an analysis that normally would be done by somebody who, if you applied it to the original data, would it resemble the alternative data? So this is actually a, a calculation from one of my groups or from projects where we were talking calculating the adjusted gross income, and we applied it to the original data and a synthetic data set that we created. And I will talk about what synthetic data is in a little bit. Another one is global measures. So this is kind of a schematic of a way to think about how you could calculate what I mean a global measure. So some people call them also discriminant-based methods. Uh, at a high level, what you're trying to do is you mix the raw or original data with your altered data. So maybe it's a synthetic data set. And when I say mix, you mix the records together, but you do have like a tag on, on the record. Is it Does it belong to the original or does it belong to the, the public data? And then you run a model on it, like a classification, like really basic one would be a logistic regression with just the main, main effects and see how well would that model figure out if that if a record came from the original data or the altered data. So this is trying to distributionally look at whether or not these two data sets are similar. So if the quote unquote model struggles to identify which record came from the original or the synthetic or public file, then that means that you generate a data set that's very similar. Um, if it immediately figures it out, then you didn't do a very good job of, of making sure that you hit a certain kind of uh, quality. So what are some of the ways to protect data? Uh, again, I'm trying to avoid equations and things like that. So I like to use paintings. And so, and actually I have this in my book. This is a famous Seurat painting. It's in the, uh, I believe it's the Art Institute in Chicago. And it's very iconic with this, like the pointillism style with these figures in the park. And so usually when you see data, you just want to get this high level of like, I see the figures, they're in a park, there's some, some lake and they're enjoying and having a great time. So one of the methods to protect this data is, well, we could suppress some individuals. So we still get the sense of like who is in the park, but let's, if you go back and forth here, we are missing some people. And so that could be very small population areas that because they're too identifiable or certain, like when I say population areas, it could be geographic or demographic in terms of like race and ethnicity. And I'll get that into a moment about why that's so tricky and so hard to protect those individuals. Another method is to do generalization. What I mean by that is to group people into higher categories. So a really classic example is education data, where instead of reporting if somebody doesn't have high school or has high school, GED, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, Associate's degree, Master's degree, MPA and MBA, doctorate, so on and so forth, you can just say like, do they have high school or not? Do they have a high school equivalent? Do they have a bachelor science or bachelor, excuse me, equivalent or graduate degree? So you're kind of taking those like finer grain categories and grouping them up into larger ones. And so in this case, the analogy for the painting is that picking one color of green, one color of blue, and, and so on for all the other different colors. So the next one is sampling. So this was traditionally, or excuse me, not traditionally, it was back, I believe, in the early 1900s, where well, one, it's really expensive to try to do a survey of every single person living in the United States. So sampling was a method to, to kind of help with the costs and the, the time that it takes to do that. But it can also be used for privacy because you can think that, well, if we just take a 10% sample, then somebody could quote unquote 
plausibly deny if if you're part of the data. So I think in the book, I actually pick up my my poor spouse again, because <laughs> he's a white male working at a national lab. And so there's already a lot of white males who work at national lab in engineering. Oh, that's right. That was that's kind of being an engineer. But so he could plausibly deny that he was not part of the 10% sample from the, the national lab if it was part of that data set. So in this case here, uh, actually, if you zoom in, it's a 70% sample because I realized when China make these images, if I did it at 10%, you could see it. But in this case, it was a 70% sample from the pixels as the representation here. There's also noise infusion. So in this case, you can add random noise, which is going back to that Laplace uh, distribution example I did earlier. So that's one way to add noise. You can also think of a normal distribution or uniform and so on and so forth. Uh, so for this case here, I believe this was from a bell curve or a a normal distribution where it was like randomly lighting or lighting or darkening the pixels. And so you can still see that there are figures in the park, but it's just kind of fuzzy and you can't quite see it. And it reminds me of those old tube TVs for the snow, which I think most now younger generations don't even know what that is anymore. <laughs> okay, so finally, one of the ways to protect data is, of course, the synthetic data, which is very popular method. It has existed for quite some time, but it's definitely grown in popularity. One way to think of about synthetic data is you're trying to create pseudo or fake records uh, based on some sort of statistical model, model or empirical model on the data. So you're trying to be making a data set that is statistically representative of the original in some way. So let's think of it as that I fi figured out a model to highlight just the individuals in the park and then everything else doesn't matter. So that's why in this picture here, only the people are seen clearly, but everything else in the background are gone, including like the person who wanted, well, it looks like all but one of the umbrellas. So we're just gonna say that's just very much part of that person. <laughs> Okay, so this goes into the next part of this talk, which is the challenges. And so just trying to talk about how, why is this such a struggle? Because we have all these methods and we have differential privacy. So why is it so hard? So one of the things is that we talk about phones and how it's just really hard to like disconnect between time and location here. And so with cell phone data, we have that issue with one nation tracked here, right? From the New York Times article. And so it's really easy to figure out if some, where someone works, where they live, where if they have children, because you can imagine if you can figure out if somebody goes to a school in the morning or afternoon, they can figure out what is that's their morning drop off versus their afternoon pickup. And Oh, I see a question. I will answer that at the end, uh, the one on differentially private methods and multiple imputation. So that's a good question. Uh, so, so with the, the location tracking, it's hard to disentangle that and, and protect against all sorts of auxiliary information. I did think one good way that somebody tackled it, especially for differential privacy uh, methods, because differential privacy is just like, again, you have to think of worst case scenario, so it gets, becomes extra hard. So in 2020, they developed a what they called the COVID-19 co uh, community mobility reports. And one way they handled some of the location is that they grouped them into six categories. So you had recreational, uh, transportation and residential. And so they did, they grouped up to six, so that helped too. They also compared it to a baseline and just reported like a sliding window of, of two weeks at it, or was it not two weeks? No, it was it was a week at a time and they reported that and they slid it down. So if you will get, read the technical report, they did, did this clever way of just like kind of sliding the window and like pinging the data that way, that way the, the data or the epsilon, the privacy budget didn't accumulate too much. And then they compared a baseline of pre-COVID versus post-COVID to see how people were moving around. So this is a screenshot image from early 2021, actually, and from Santa Fe County, which is where I live. And so you can see it's retails, groceries, parks, so on and so forth. And well, there's an increase in residential that should make sense because we're all being good people and not traveling a lot. So we're staying at home more. Uh, but it still didn't quite address one of the biggest problems with any privacy method, which I saw as a comment from Mark Otto again on the chat, is that what about small populations or estimations, uh, extremely small areas? And I kind of call it as the small population problem. So this is a county just right next door to Santa Fe called Los Alamos County. It's where the Los Alamos National Laboratory is. And it has so few counts that they don't report it for some of the categories or there's big gaps because there was just so few samples for even that sliding window method they have. And so this is still a problem that we need to tackle is like, how do you account for those smaller populations? And so going into more of the time aspect, so why is that so hard? Uh, we already kind of paired that with location. I already talked about that. Well, 
it's also because if you track somebody over time and just like ping, like, oh, just basic information, the fact that you can see maybe changes over time makes it very revealing. So if those who don't know me, I'm really active in triathlons. And so I participate in these like crazy endurance sports. And so if you really want to know more information about me, not like I welcome it, but it's publicly out there. You can find my races and figure out exactly how old I am. Because if I shift from one age group to another one, because th those races kind of track those things. Uh, you can also figure out when I'm married because my last name changed from one race to another and figure out where I live because some races like to report the location of like, oh, look how diverse our race is. Like it tracks all these people from these different states. So the funny thing is I actually found a screenshot of one race I did while in grad school and it actually says my exact age, let alone the fact that which division I am in. So it has my name, my exact age, my gender and the town I'm in. So this is all publicly available and somebody, if they were really adamant on trying to figure out all this other sensitive information about me, they could keep track of me over time while there. And so going into, again, I kept hinting at it, the small population problem and why this is so difficult. And I, I think this, the, the example I'm giving here is one in the book that highlights why we really need to teach people about the data that we get it could be altered and can list, mislead people to it like an improper data story and not just because of the privacy concerns too. So what do I mean here? Well, there was a instance in early 2020 where people were like, we need to be better about social distancing, stay locked down. And so a startup out of New York called Unicast made it a dashboard and was calculating social distancing of individuals and said, good job, DC, you're doing a great job, A plus, you've significantly decreased your, your location or movement, but shame on you, Wyoming, you are the lowest ranked one. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, you can also see that New Mexico is there too. <laughs> so <laughs> these places are like, how dare you not, you know, socially distanced? Well, the problem was the data set they used is at the county level and not at a census tract or a smaller geography. So it was actually it wasn't as fine grained as one would think. And my argument to, to the, the result from this dashboard is that, well, that's not fine enough to make those claims that some states are better than others. And what do I mean by that? Well, at the beginning of 2020, I was living in Arlington and I was thinking, okay, before the lockdown, I traveled probably about 70 miles per week. And so I just have a screenshot of my, like my path that I was biking to DC, getting to Urban Institute. And so it was about 70 because like to and from work, going to the grocery store, going to see a Smithsonian because that was like, my jam was to see all the Smithsonian's. But then during the lockdown that first week, for March, I went down to one mile per week because the grocery store was so close. So I just would wake up ridiculously early because I was like a terrified of people <laughs> and I go to the grocery store really early, do all my shopping and then be a hermit for the week and not go back out again until I ran out of food. Versus I, I grew up in a place called Salmon, Idaho. Uh, so for context here, so Arlington is in a county, this, uh, it's 26 square miles roughly for the, the that county. Uh, Salmon, Idaho is the largest town of, th uh, of the county it's in, which that town is 3,000 people. The county is the size of Connecticut. So that's roughly 44,500 square miles. So you are comparing a 26 square mile place to a over into the thousands. And so how much traveling would I have done if like growing up in this place? Well, before the lockdown, it would have been 350 miles because I lived outside of town as most people do in rural areas of, of this part of country. And it, also included our pilgrimage to Costco in Missoula because the town uh, grocery store did not have enough supplies. So this is 140 miles and you think round trip, that's almost 300. So during a lockdown, let's say if I couldn't go to school or go to the local grocery store as much, I would still need to go to Costco for our bare sensible needs, which we did every two weeks. So pre-lockdown versus post-lockdown or during lockdown, it didn't change a whole lot. So this kind of data wasn't available again, because probably a privacy concern is getting to something smaller than county level. Now, I'm, again, I'm trying to try to wrap up. I think I've talked a little too much, so I'm trying to make sure we have enough time for questions, but I did highlight a little bit of the privacy laws that exist. So we'll just do a quick rundown here, which is I do compare in the book, uh, these different private privacy laws that we have in the United States, because uh, we have SIPSI, which is the Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act, excuse me, Title 13, Title 26, we have HIPAA and the California laws. And I compare the California laws more with the ones in the European Union because these ones actually protect your consumer privacy. 
and that's a big one that people don't realize is that uh, we don't have any good consumer privacy laws, at least at the federal level. So that's something I do talk about quite a bit and make those comparisons as Stephanie mentioned in the beginning. So quick thoughts on the future, again, because of time, I'm actually gonna skip some of these. I'm actually going to go straight to my big punchline, which is why I really want people to focus on the communication aspect and why I'm doing, why I wrote this book, why I'm doing all these talks. So my first, before I go into all that, I'm gonna ask you a question, which is, what resources would you recommend on machine learning? And the follow-up would be, think of, do you have any, videos, blogs, articles, uh, lecture series do you recommend? Do you think of like somebody at a beginner, intermediate, advanced level, or even thinking about, is that person an economist? Are they a demographer? Are they a social scientist? And I bet a lot of you would already have an idea of what is that favorite communication material you would share. Now, if I were to say the same thing, but for data privacy methods, uh, would you have the same idea of what you would share to somebody? Again, different levels of understanding, different backgrounds, different medians. And most people I would expect would not know as much. And that just shows how little communication materials we have. And this is something I really want this to happen is that we need it because it becomes a big impact in our public policy making because people don't understand what's going on. They are concerned about what's gonna happen, let's say with the census. And so we saw a lot of lawsuits occurring from there. I mean, things have gotten definitely better, uh, Here's some materials I, I like to sh showcase. Here's a blog. There's a chance is a statistical magazine, right? We have a YouTube video. Uh, I, of course, I have my book here. <laughs> but all these did not exist when I started researching this area as a graduate student. We have come far away, but we still need to work on more because when I posed that question, you guys probably didn't know a lot of resource materials here. So in summary, I talked about the motivation, some of the backgrounds and methodologies, talking about traditional disclosure risks, versus differential privacy, utility measures, privacy methods, some of the challenges and the fact that we don't have enough privacy laws to protect consumer privacy. And then some of the thoughts of the future, which I kind of went through quickly. So if you have specific questions on that, um, happy to answer them now or do a follow up later on. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. That was great. Um, it looks like we have one question in the chat and I encourage others to add them. Um, so do you want to start with that question? And then I'm happy to ask questions as well and encourage others too. Yeah, I saw this question earlier and I thought it'd be better to uh, answer it at the sure. end. Just so I, uh, how do differential privacy methods interact with multiple imputation or missing data? Does a missing data point need to have noise added to it? That's a great question. And so uh, without going too deep into the details, that was something I actually looked into one paper I wrote with my uh, advisor. You can do multiple imputations, but you have to make some adjustments to it. So uh, at the face, for those who don't know about multiple imputation, you try to make multiple data sets uh, based on your model or maybe multiple models. But you have to think of for differential privacy, you're gonna be touching that data again each time. So you actually have to divide epsilon by the number of times you generate multiple uh, data sets. So remember when epsilon is smaller, that means less accuracy. So part of that exercise of that research paper was kind of see if whether or not it was worth the accuracy uh, cost of splitting epsilon, or was it better to have those multiple data sets to kind of do the comp what we call the combination rules to get the estimates or the variability. Now, that is really important, especially for like missing data, you do need to add uh, noise to that. And so uh, again, I'm not going to go too much details because it gets a little more technical, but happy to follow up more details with that person if they like, and my contact information is on the screen. So hopefully Great. that helps. So Diane Wilmack acts as noted that we spend a lot of time talking about disclosure risk, but what about balancing disclosure risk with the risk of jeopardy to an individual relative to the type of data collected? Oh, that is a great question. I actually, uh, this is interesting timing because I just had a conversation with Nancy Potok this morning about, about that. Uh, we were talking about how, uh, hopefully I'm answering the question. So we were talking about how it was like the sense of a privacy threat. And actually when people talk about like, oh, this is, here's this disclosure risk on this person, but you don't actually compare it to like maybe other people's sense of, of disclosure risks. And so Basically, it was a general call or, or discussion. Well, I say I say call. I'm going to try to call people to think about like how can we think of like everybody's versions or thoughts on what exactly is 
disclosure risk? Uh, how is like, let's say in this case, differential privacy versus traditional? Like, is there some way to show uh, maybe like a baseline privacy threat model that most people agree on and then compare the two? Um, and, and actually, I guess to that punchline is like, we're actually not spending enough time on that, I think. I think we should do more research on this. And it's one that I personally would love to research more on. So I am applying. <laughs> Not like I'm encouraging people to scoop me or something, but that's like a proposal I'm putting in is to see if we can measure what are people's sense of privacy risk and see if we can translate to a threat and then see how that compares to what is being done and applied to federal data sets and like such as differential privacy and some of these traditional methods. So that was a longer winded answer. Hopefully I got to the, the point for you. Basically, we need more research on this as well. So yeah, a that's a better question. one. <laughs> <laughs> so I like the so the next question, what do consumer privacy laws have to do with statistical disclosure control? Oh, that's a great question. So I'll try to be quick about that answer too. So if you dig into GDPR, which I always forget the acronym for that, the European Union law, it actually has a clause, I think it's Article 25, that says that you must use the state of the art, which is interesting phrasing, state of art methods to protect the data if you're going to release it, basically. And so that's why statistical disclosure control methods are, are very much a part of it, because they think about that the laws are trying to say, well, okay, you are, let's say, a marketing company and you're trying to sell a data set that you collected to, let's say, Facebook or maybe another industry partner and say like, well, you can buy our data and use it for other things. Well, it's kind of sensitive. Did you think about the consent of people? Did you properly protect it? So that's where statistical disclosure control methods come in for consumers. Um, privacy laws. Uh, for the California laws, they are lighter. Um, again, I'm trying to make this quick. So they are lighter. Uh, they do say that there needs to be something about the public share of data and also between entities, but again, it's not as strict. So I talk again a lot more about it in the book. Okay, um, that sounds good. So are there, um, uh, Connie Citro has a question about differential privacy and she said, you say that differential privacy intends to protect against the direct threat. Is this appropriate for census data which are not particularly sensitive to begin with? Also, I believe that part of the answer to permit greater accuracy, higher epsilon, is to have laws that put penalties on users for willful misuse of data that they re-identify to harm an individual. So I think that goes back to the adverse effects that you and I were having a conversation about. And yeah. I meant direst threat, not direct. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Okay. <laughs> that, that, actually, that, that helps, Connie. Thanks. Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Connie, because I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't. <laughs> that <is this laughs> no, I, no, no, I, I corrected that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'll try again to give a quick answer. I do think our laws need to get updated because last time uh, Title 13 got updated was I think early, was it early 90s or early 2000s? It was one of those, two, like last, last time it's been updated. So that's pre-social media, right? And because and, there's an argument that somebody will make, it's like, well, I just walk down this place down the road and I can see that there's so many people who live here or like they share that information on Facebook or Twitter, like why should that matter? So. That was my first kind of my first attempt at answering is I do think we, we need to update laws and then think about like those meaningful penalties for willful misuse. I totally agree, Connie. Um, so then let's see, I'm trying to make sure. Uh, is this appropriate for census data, which are not particularly? I, that's the thing is like D, different to privacy. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a step back. There are definitely people who think that we need all the accuracy as much as possible. And then those who think we have to have all the risk. And obviously we need something in between. And what is that in between? I'm not sure. That's why I wanted to work on this project. We're saying, what is people's sense of risk? What is their sense of like the accuracy they need? Um, one, one reason to think about a privacy threat or a different kind of privacy threat model is that it, we are seeing that a lot of differentially private methods add a lot. Like a, excessive amount of noise. So actually one paper, if people want to go in more technical detail, we released a paper in, last fall called a feasibility study. Now I compare it to say a feasibility study where we kind of quote unquote stress test a bunch of differentially private methods to see if it was going to make meaningful results for if you were a tax economist, because the data set that we're looking at was administrative tax data from IRS. And some methods worked really well uh, for certain, certain kind of statistics, like it was count tabular statistics, summary statistics, like contrails and means worked really well. But once we did uh, ordinary least squares, 
it kind of fell off a cliff to put it not so lightly, I guess, uh, especially when you're trying to do full inference. So that actually eliminated a lot of methods because they couldn't give us a confidence interval on the estimates. So I encourage you to check out that paper that we wrote on that if you want to go into the technical details. Okay, um, we have a few more questions, Claire. So are there any rules of thumb for flagging if our data is identifiable? You mentioned the sampling method as an example. If we've sampled 10% of the people in a particular subgroup, small population, is this too specific still? Oh, that's a great question. And that goes into that whole like iterative process that I kind of mentioned in that workflow, because I do think that in general, as long as you're thinking about it and doing your, I should say like trying to do your due diligence because you can't protect from every risk, right? Yeah, the fact that Epsilon says that the value has to be close to zero, but not zero, right? Because you're accepting the fact that once you release that data, there is going to be some risk, right? And so you're trying to figure out exactly like what point is it just too much or too little? So yeah, sampling, like when I said 10%, maybe that's what you're comfortable with. Maybe that's what the law says, or maybe it's like what you're, the people who participate in the data because they because their opinion also matters. Maybe you have to make the sample even smaller, five, or maybe it's comfortable doing 20. So basically all that I'm saying is it's an art. In, in addition to a science is trying to figure out where's that balance. And so I know that's an satisfactory answer, but I do encourage that you kind of read up what's maybe standard, what are people's thoughts on it. And if you work with the users and the who is the curator and having that open conversation, you're gonna go way farther than if you just made assumptions on your own. So engaging, engaging the community. Mm -hmm. Um, so following up on an earlier question, do you think that the privacy loss could be an insurable risk? So now, now we want you to switch from being a statistician to an insurance agent. <laughs> uh, that is a great question. And I want, I, I want to say that, uh, that is up to policymakers because I am the <laughs> the translator, as I like to tell people. I I try to figure out what are the latest methods. Uh, how do I explain that to a general audience, to the public policy members, to uh, one audience I always had in mind when I wrote this book is my parents because <laughs> they never finished college, so they still think I'm like an app developer. Last time I talked to them, <laughs> so hopefully now they know what I do. <laughs> but it's. It, it could be, but that's not a question I'm going to dig into. So I'm kind of deflecting that question, but that's not something I'm, like I said, I'm interested in. All right, we have one more question and then we'll open it up for a few minutes um, if anyone just wants to ask a question. Um, does restrictive privacy potentially diminish the data for public policy? And is there a sweet spot for small populations that you've seen a holy grail somewhere? Oh, so repeating the question just to make sure I understand. Uh, being more restrictive with privacy potentially diminishes the usefulness for public policy. And so when I was saying that tension or that trade-off, yeah, so you do think of of when you become more restrictive, you are going to make the utility less. But you could be, as you imagine with like all these different methods I talked about, that, that curve is not linear, right? It could be like kind of swooping and you're trying to figure out what that inflection point is, which I know most economists love. <laughs> What is that inflection point like to optimize between the two? Um, but in terms of what is it like? You, you, yeah, you're trying to find that sweet spot, finding that holy grail. But sometimes that's not achievable at all. Maybe it's like there's a gaping hole of abyss where you go through like, well, it gets kind of close. And then all of a sudden you expose people or you have to make it fully messy. And so that goes back to the answer of the last question, which is it's really important to engage those communities, because at least right now, the answer for like, let's say, small populations um, you get a kind of a dichotomy really with the privacy methods on those populations. The, what I mean by the dichotomy is like either you remove them entirely because you want to make it super protective, right? So right. if you remove them, you get data sets like that says it's white or other, which is terrible, right? <laughs> or you have to misrepresent them. So instead of saying that like I was the only Asian high schooler <laughs> in that rural era of Idaho. So instead of saying there's one high schooler, you're gonna say that there's dozens out of the, my graduating class was 70. <laughs> right. That doesn't work doesn't either. <laughs> no, it does not. And so maybe at some point you have to talk to that community. It's like, okay, these are the extremes, but this is the health benefit you will have. So kind of give that question of, at what point do you sacrifice your personal privacy for the public good or your personal social good? And I 
that's one of the big questions. And I like your idea of the engaging the community. Um, I know we're right at two o'clock and people are dropping off, but if Claire, you have time, I think we'll answer these last two questions and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, so Mark Otto, uh, if regression dropped off in use, more complicated analysis would be worse. Are there usually different access levels to be allowed to do these analysis on more accurate data? Any general access rules or laws? Yeah, so I actually ended up skipping this a bit. There's a, if you look under one of my bullets, it's tiered access and, and updated privacy laws. So one could think about that there could be something in the middle where you're like, oh, I want access to complicated data. So backing up a little bit, for those who don't know, traditionally the way you access data is in the two extremes of you get the public data that is available anywhere, or you go get the confidential data, like you have, but you have to get a background check. And there's nothing in between currently, or at least for the most part. And so some people don't need the full data, but if they do, well, there's limitations like the eligibility to get direct access is you have to be a US citizen. So that eliminates a lot of people. The other thing is sometimes you have to be at a data enclave or a terminal, which by the way, the closest one to me is in Boulder, Colorado, which is a seven hour drive. So that is not at all equitable. So the idea is there should be something in between, like let's say there's like a online terminal instead. So any, anywhere you have internet access, you can access there. You can submit your answer queries through this interface. So it's a kind of a query based system to directly access the confidential data and then come back out. So that's actually a project that we're working at at Urban Institute with the Internal Revenue Service. Cool. OK. And then uh, the last question from Joe Gat Gatsworth, um, how do the privacy and confidentiality respondents uh, were promised entered into determining your choice of Epsilon or other measure? Ooh, great question. And I don't have a good answer for that because it's kind of new ground, actually. The, again, there, since there's no good consumer law. Okay, so we're backing up a little bit here. So if we were to start with consumer privacy laws, there is pretty much none. So people just like, when you said, hey, I want these coupons and I would give up my privacy for these things, right? Uh, the person who's collecting it can do whatever they want. So they're not going to consult you for your Epsilon, right? Uh, in terms of some of the other federal data set, uh, databases, uh, excuse me, federal databases, yes. Some federal agencies haven't switched over to different privacy because they haven't figured out how to convey that to policymakers on updating the laws to, or showing how those laws uh, or those new methods fit under the laws. So one of the other projects I'm part of is we're working with the Bureau of Economic Analysis on doing trainings actually for the workers say like, these are the ways you could use these newer methods, see if they fit for your data. And then if they do, then go talk to the people who make the laws and see if we can update it that way. And so that's one way to, I think, approach that and then hopefully talk to the consumers or the respondents in the data. So there's always still a qualitative part to all of our work, which I find interesting and really <laughs> important. Um, so Claire, this was a great presentation and I wanna also thank the audience for the great questions. And um, we had an amazing, we were up to 82 people at one point. And so I think it was uh, really exciting that you could share your book and your thoughts about this. It's definitely an issue that we're all interested in and wanna follow. So thank you very much. And thank you to the audience. Um, yeah. We will sign off. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for attending. Sure. Oh, I forgot. This is my book. I was supposed to show it. it <laughs> well, you did in uh, the resources. <laughs>